Hello and welcome to another episode of Autogafuel. Today with me, AJ and Connie. This weekend, you join us in Valencia and we have with us the new Volkswagen E-Up, a small electric city car that we're fairly familiar with. But with the new facelift, you get a bigger battery, more range, and wait for it, at a lower price. Can you really have your cake and eat it too? Well, we'll find out on today's episode. With the new Volkswagen ID3, Volkswagen is betting big on that car taking it to the next era, the electric age. Aptly named the ID3 because the first being the Beetle, the second being the Golf, and now this is going to be the new third identity. To ensure that there's enough gap in the portfolio in terms of pricing between the base variant of the ID3 and the E-Up, this new facelift does in fact cost a little bit less than before, but you get more features as well. What's new now for the new facelift of the E-Up? Well, apart from what's going on underneath in terms of the uh, technology and the drivetrain, first thing you'll notice is the new Volkswagen logo. It's a little bit more retro looking and we've seen this before and it's nice to see it here as well on the E-Up. Of course, things like these headlamps are still quite basic with halogen bulbs and this is some of the uh, ways how Volkswagen is trying to bring the price down, keep this uh, at a budget entry level to get more people into the electric, uh, into electric cars. It's about 1.64 meters wide, blanked off area down here and nice daytime running LED lights and interesting contours in the lower part of the bumper. The E-Up is 3.6 meters long, it's 1.5 meters tall and it weighs about 1,200 kilograms. It's very easy, you only have two trims, you have the standard E-Up and then you have the style, the one we have here. So what's different with the style? Well, first of all, you get the option to pick either a white or a black roof, which looks really nice in contrast with this red color that you see down here in the body. You also get that color here on the outside rear view mirror. Along with that, in the style trim, you get some nice uh, alloy wheels, like the ones you see here, which again have that very typical uh, electric car kind of design, and these are 15 inches. The rest of the profile of the E-Up is pretty much the same as the regular Up, there's no change. And again, like I said, with its siblings, the Mi and the City Go, very nice city car proportions coming with a five-door configuration only. Let's take a look at the back of the E-Up. First of all, it is, again, similar to the regular Up that we know. And things that I like, you know, uh, is this rear hatch which has the window which goes all the way down so it's one singular glossy black look which I think is really funky. Speaking of funky we see the tail lamps which are also have these interesting shapes. The big E up logo down here and this blue with that line that we saw in the front bumper as well going all the way across the bottom of the hatch. 
You can also get the e-up with the with a uh, reversing camera. You also have parking sensors, and of course, <laughs> no exhaust tips to talk about whatsoever. All right, let's take a look under the hood. Like I was mentioning before, there is a better battery this time. So the nominal energy capacity of this new battery is 32.3 kilowatt hour. The electric motor generates 83 PS or metric horsepower and uh, 212 Newton meters of torque at 2700 RPM. It's all only front wheel drive. And the WLTP cycle uh, for the claimed efficiency has this rated at about 14.5 kilowatt hours per 100, kilo, uh, 100 kilometers. That gives the range about uh, in the ballpark of 260 kilometers. But as we all know, a lot of things can affect the range of an electric car. Your driving style, the temperature, if you're running the air conditioning and so on and so forth. So it is, it is much better than before, of course, but you still have to be you know, careful that if you're gonna do long drives all the time, you know, this might not be the best car for that. This is more suited for a daily commute to your office, to drop your kids off at school, things like that. So the battery is actually tucked away under the floor, which gives this e-up, and as with most electric cars, a great center of gravity, which is low and wide. To charge it, you have the ports where you would find the regular petrol filler cap. Now, being a petrol head, all these numbers are a bit tricky for me, so I've written them down so I don't get them wrong. So, are you ready? To charge it with a DC fast charger of 40 kilowatts, you can get 80% in one hour. So this is great for charging it up early in the morning before you go to work for one hour. If you plug in with a 7.2 kilowatt AC charger, you get 100% in five and a half hours. But if you just wanna plug it in at home, that actually takes about 16 hours. So a full overnight charge uh, to get it up to 100%. So let's take a look at the key. Very conventional, so not much new here, nothing really fancy. The door opens really nice and wide with a large opening, easy to get inside. Also closes with a nice thud. Now let's take a look inside and see what the materials are. I do like this dash of red from the body paint that comes into the interior, but the plastic is generally fairly hard and monotone but you do get some nice storage area which you can easily fit some water bottles. You have automatic windows for the front two only. The rear windows, as you might know, don't go, um, cannot be slid down. You can only pop them out and we'll take a closer look once we get inside. Stepping in is fairly easy. Again, thanks to this tall body and really large opening. You're sitting also fairly upright. If I were to bring my knees closer towards me, you see that you know, I have a very little gap between my thigh and the seat. So this is a little bit more upright. It's not so low and sporty. This is as low as the seat can go. So thankfully you do have adjustment for height. Of course, moving the seat forward and backwards and reclining it but another space where they have done a little bit of cost cutting is with the steering wheel it can only be tilted up and down it does not telescope front and back but still plenty of headroom i like the nice bright light uh, the headliner so it feels very spacious inside so let's take a look at the steering wheel a very typical Volkswagen, but you have some controls here to navigate through the menu on the instrument cluster. And on the left-hand side, you have some controls for the telephony. 
you also have um, a very nice instrument cluster up here. So there is a tachometer on the left hand side which actually has a very interesting uh, display. As you can see there's a blue area which is kind of the recommended RPM for the electric motor to get the best out of it in terms of range. And there's also a green area which says charge. So you can see how much of charge is being recuperated through the regenerative brakes. A large speedometer in the middle. The speedometer is also uh, pretty useful because it has also this blue range to give you an idea as a suggestion where you can expect the most amount of range if you drive it within that speed range. And a battery charge level right here on the right hand side. The display has a lot of useful information so right now you can see that the average consumption that we are having is 14.7 kilowatt hours for 100 kilometers. Keep in mind that we've had the car parked with the lights on while we were filming so you can expect numbers a little bit lower than this but it is fairly close to the WLTP um, rated figure. Also provides you with extra information like the distance traveled, of course the range that's left is always displayed in the bottom. You can also control your audio as well as some general settings and you can see here that the E sound has been activated. This is kind of a, this generates an artificial humming or a thrumming sound at speeds up to 22 kilometers per hour to alert pedestrians nearby that there is a car because electric cars are really quiet and they can just sneak up on you. And this tone uh, fades away from 22 kilometers uh, per hour onwards and becomes silent later on. So some general things over here and yeah, so very useful information. There's an interesting inlay right here in the middle of the dashboard which breaks the monotony of this black color. Also nice E-Up logo, but generally the materials are fairly hard. On the plus side you have a damped glove box with some really interesting features. For example, yes there is enough space, but you also have these indentations to keep some coins, some sunglasses up here, put your parking ticket and even fix a pen. Now the infotainment system is pretty interesting and you guys probably already know this but you have to use it in conjunction with your actual phone. So there is a phone dock on the top where you can run the Maps and More app which you can of course use or you can just run your regular Android Auto or um, the, um, the Google Maps. Down here you do have a screen which is not a touch screen but you can access some things like for example the built-in radio there's also some system settings that you can access, sound settings. The audio system, by the way, sounds pretty nice. And yeah, so the app connection will allow you to connect your phone and this will synchronize and you can access the menus on your phone. Plus also have things like um, connected uh, commands to maybe turn on the air conditioning before you get into the car, things like that. The buttons down here are also used to navigate through the menu and um, select options and the top section has the climate control unit. In this case we have the automatic climate control so you can pick a temperature and press auto and again depending on the profile you have if you have eco or eco plus some of these systems are tuned to be more efficient and less responsive. On the other hand you have defoggers, seat heaters and as you will see on this side the lane keeping assist off button which is pretty cool because this car comes a standard with lane keeping assist with steering intervention. There's a shelf to keep your phone, a beverage holder down here, 12 volt power socket, this is the drive mode selector so you have normal, eco and eco plus. We'll take a closer look at this later on once we're driving and over here we have the gear lever. Connie, if you press the brake, we can put it into reverse and take a quick look at the reversing camera, which you can see over here. So pretty interesting, it also has guidelines and there's also the parking sensor. So in conjunction, this is pretty useful. All right, let's take a look in the back. The door opens really nice and wide. There is a very large opening to get inside. So the same fabric seats that we saw in the front, so the same fabric over here, although not much difference in the color. And But it's easy to identify the isofix points, which are very open, easily identifiable. Let's get inside. There is no handle for me to hold on to. The door is fairly monotone and hard, as you can see. The window also doesn't wind down. 
it only pops out like that so yes quite a lot of cost cutting but nevertheless it's not unbearable back here i have just about enough knee room i would say or maybe not really any extra my knees are touching the front seat the back is a bit scooped out to liberate some more space this seat is set to my driving position i'm five foot eight or about 1.7 meters the backrest is also fairly upright but for short journeys in the city it's not too bad the bench itself is also not that wide so i don't have too much of under thigh support but because it's a little bit higher, you know, it doesn't feel like I'm squatting. Overall, it is pretty good. Let's open the hatch, a little button here to release it. It does look like it's all glass, but there is actually a steel uh, or a metal frame. So you get 251 liters of boot space, which is pretty good for a car in this class. You have a movable floor, so you can have two separate compartments to keep your items. I also like how it's engineered to slide along these rails very easily so you don't have to fiddle around with it these little details i really like if you put it down here you can also access all the charging cables and they have their own nice little uh, area down here to store them away so everything has its place to give you an idea here is a standard cabin suitcase and it fits in very easily you can fit another one standing upright but if you want more space you can easily fold the seats in a 60-40 fashion. And yes, with this floor down here, you don't get a flat loading area, but if you were to put it up here, then you do. So it's as practical as it can be given its dimensions. Let's start off the driving section of today's episode by driving in the city where, let's be honest, this car will spend most of its time. First, let's start off with the comfort. And yes, this electric up weighs about 300 kilograms more than the petrol engine version, but they have stiffened the suspension and therefore actually it's a lot more, um, you know, the, the suspension is a lot more adept to this extra weight. And here on the city bumpy streets, you don't feel that stiffness. In fact, it feels really compliant. It feels really plush. It's very comfortable. All the sharp undulations and uh, you know that you see here on the streets are absorbed really well and do not filter into the cabin. The seats are also really supportive. You are sitting upright, but there's plenty of adjustment for you to find a comfortable position for yourself. And they are very supportive and very soft. And overall, I think, really good seats. They don't uh, have too much of side bolstering and things like that. They're not very sporty, but again, being comfort oriented, I definitely think they are really good. Then let's talk about the visibility. That's also uh, an area where the up excels in. Because of that upright seating position, you do have really good visibility out the front thanks to this large windshield. Also out the side, thanks to these large windows and even a very large rear view mirror and this rectangular um, mirror and the big window really aids in the view out back. It's also really easy to see out the side because the B pillar is fairly narrow and it's actually just behind your head so it doesn't obstruct your line of sight. Another thing that aids driving around in the city is the steering wheel. It is very light here at low speeds, so you can easily make quick turns as you navigate through these bends and chicanes and roundabouts. The steering rack itself is not necessarily that quick though, so you do need to turn it quite a bit to get some, uh, get some reaction from it. But again, for the city, it's really good. Then let's talk a little bit more about what makes this uh, the electric version better in the city. And let's start off with the acceleration. So as you guys might know, electric motors generate peak torque very low down in the RPM, almost pretty much at zero. And that means that when you're like this in a city and then you wanna get going really quickly, you have instant, instant torque to push you and jump through these little gaps that you find in the city traffic. 
So that way it's really useful. Also here at low speeds, the, uh, there's that E sound that is generated. So it's like this humming artificial sound that is played to alert the pedestrians around you so that uh, they are aware of a car that is coming down the road. And it happens up to 22 kilometers per hour and beyond that it starts getting softer and softer. Throttle response is really sharp, or I can't really say throttle, the acceleration is really sharp. So I'm in the normal driving mode and this is where I get the most amount of performance, but I also have an Eco and an Eco Plus mode. In the Eco Plus mode, the comfort and the performance features are restricted. And if I go to Eco Plus, it says comfort and performance severely restricted. So I'm just gonna keep it in normal because I think this is a good test to see how the, um, you know, it can still manage the air conditioning, the performance that I want from it, and all of these convenience features, along with trying to be as economical as possible. Along with the different driving modes, you also have various levels of uh, regenerative braking. So if you use the gear lever, and if you go right, you can go down the levels from three to one, and similarly, if you go left, you can go one, two, three. But in fact, if you go all the way down to this B over here, it says recuperation level four. Now this is pretty much like a one pedal function. So the minute you get off the, 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 uh, the accelerator pedal, the brakes are really strong. So if you just modulate the angle at which you are using the, um, the pedal, you can effectively, effectively, with practice, drive 80% of the time with just one pedal. It definitely takes quite a bit of getting used to, but in this way, it's, again, very easy to use in the city. You don't have to keep moving between the pedals. Of course, there's no clutch. It's a single transmission electric motor, but you can take it one step forward and just use one pedal. So there's a little bit of space behind me. So right now, if I were to release the, the accelerator pedal, it's pretty much applying a very strong braking force. And this is pretty, uh, Pretty cool. It's not something new. Though it's, it's there with a lot of uh, with most electric cars. Actually, it's a great way to uh, you know get some energy back into your batteries when you're driving around in city. And um, yeah, you don't really have to use the actual friction brakes. You can save on your brake pad costs every year by using this kind of mode. But I think the best is to actually leave it in recuperation, recuperation level three. Here it has that very natural um, engine braking feeling. It's actually a little bit more pronounced than that. And even right now, like if I let go of the accelerator pedal completely, it is almost coming to a standstill on its own. So I don't really need that level four, which requires me to be have more finesse with the accelerator pedal. So with that, you know, I have the gauges, which tells me on the left-hand side when I am generating more charge with this recuperation, so it's really useful. Right now it says I'm getting 16.3 kilowatt hours for 100 kilometers as the consumption, which is higher than the uh, WLTP rated figure. But the truth is we had this parked out with the lights on and we were loading things in and out and getting pictures and filming. So you can expect numbers around 14, 14.5, 14 I would say. The range right now we have is 207 kilometers, so that's again, plenty for a daily commute. In fact, the average German drives about 35 kilometers per day um, for their office commute. And with this much of range, you can easily go an entire week without having to recharge the batteries. And then you can have a separate car that you wanna drive on the weekends for fun or you know, on long distances with your family and so on, while you leave this on charge and then use this every day of the week to get to office. And I think that's a great option for somebody who's looking for a second car, or wants to save money and wants to be greener and wants to get onto the electric car bandwagon. I think it's a good option. Let's see, apart from that, yeah, if you do have to use the brakes, the brakes are also gonna first initiate themselves in the recuperation mode before they actually engage the friction, uh, uh, the mode with the actual brake pads. So even there, the minute you, I press the brake, I can see that I'm generating more charge. And uh, that way it's really cool. It's really more effective as a brake pedal, as well as um, giving me some electricity back. The navigation, you know, I know that 
this is a really cost-effective way of doing this. And the truth is, like Brian mentioned when he drove the Seat Me recently, the electric version, which is pretty much the same car, um, it's a bit hit and miss. I mean, the pro is that, first of all, they don't have to charge you a lot of money to get one of these systems. And, you know, you leave the technology to the masters, to these smartphones uh, companies who have been doing this and who invest millions and millions uh, into generating and developing uh, and making good technology, you know? Google Maps is fantastic. You, don't really, you really don't need to worry about that. And at the same time, you can, you know, a car's infotainment system also tends to get out of date very quickly. And in this way, you are kind of safeguarding yourself against that because here, you know, especially in a budget car, the tech might not be that great. And within a couple of years, it's already going to feel really outdated. Instead, just don't do it at all. And I see that, but this mount, this docking station itself is not the most easy to use. If you want to change the, the size and use a different phone, you pretty much have to remove it to expand the, the lower two arms and you can't really swivel it. It doesn't have like a ball joint where you can really change the angle to what you really want it to be. It's facing directly out to the side, uh, to, uh, to the back. So even this is not that well executed, I feel. And if you do want to pair your phone, sometimes we tried that it would, it would take a lot longer. It would say phone not detected and things like that. So it's overall, there's still a little bit of hiccups with this system. But yeah, in the city, it's definitely very, very, and very much at home. We're out on the highway now, and let's see how the E-Up fares when you need to take it at high speed. First of all, there is the lane keeping assist, which comes as standard which is really useful when you're out on the highway. It is not, you know, the semi-autonomous kind of a feature where it will scan the lanes all the time and try to keep you in the middle. Instead, it's more of like a safety net. So if I were to go close to the edge here, the car will automatically steer me back into uh, the, towards the center of the lane. But it's not going to track and try to keep me in the middle. So in the end, it's gonna kind of ping pong you back and forth but it's still really useful to have and I'm glad that it's a standard feature. If I were to get out of the normal mode and go into Eco Plus mode, because again, now I'm on the highway, I don't need to have that instant torque. I don't need to have that sharp acceleration. I just need to be able to maintain momentum. Similarly, I'm gonna go from regeneration brakes level three all the way to one. Now the throttle, or not the throttle, I keep saying throttle, the accelerator pedal is really dull. If I were to floor it, yeah, it gives me a response, but you know, there's a lot of very linear, uh, you know, distance where not much really happens when I'm pressing the accelerator pedal. But that's really good because on the highway, I just want to maintain momentum. So right now we're at 100, and I need to bring it down to 80. So if I have regeneration in one, it will just generally, uh, sorry, gradually coast. So it's also really useful to use these different levels um, and use them for different things. Like regeneration level three is great for the city. The full generation, uh, regeneration level four, which is like the one pedal feature is great for start stop city traffic. But if you keep it at level one, it's even better when you're out just cruising on the highway. Getting to a hundred is a bit difficult in eco plus mode. I think I'll have to go to normal mode and now it does let me get up to a hundred. The top speed is 130. Since there is no engine, there is not a lot of noise inside the cabin. In fact, because of the lack of an engine noise, you do hear the wind a little bit more, but on the whole, this cabin is very quiet and very hushed. The tires are also really quiet because they are the more efficient electric car design tires. So overall, a very refined, comfortable cabin. On, this, uh, on the highway at higher speeds, even the suspension is really composed. The car feels fairly planted. Because of that low center of gravity of that extra weight from the batteries, you don't feel the car rolling too much as well. The steering also becomes a little bit more heavier at higher speeds. So on the whole, even though this is a city car, 
you can easily take it out on the highway with no problem at all. The car also feels really planted on the highway thanks to that low center of gravity and that uh, really well set up suspension it gives you a lot of confidence. The steering wheel also becomes a lot heavier now at higher speeds. So on the whole this car is very happy to go on the highway. Of course you have to be careful about the range and that's uh, you know highway speeds are not the best for electric cars especially the city electric cars but still if you put it in eco plus mode and uh, things like that it shouldn't be a problem so yeah you could do you could do long distances very easily i think in fact you could do around 200 and, uh, 250 kilometers um, on the highway without a problem So let's summarize today's episode of the new Volkswagen E-Up. The prices for the base variant start at around 22,000 euros, but the style trim that you see here is around 23,000 euros. And at that price, it is really attractive. Yes, the materials on the inside are not the best, the infotainment is a bit hit and miss, and the space in the back seat and the trunk is a bit limited. But it's very comfortable, very composed and quiet, even out on the highway. It's really maneuverable in tight city spaces, and it's pretty fun to drive on twisting roads as well. So it does look like you can have your cake and eat it too. So let me know, what do you guys think? Is this enough for you to move away from petrol and diesel cars and buy your first electric car? Put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.